Um, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Sam, and I will be the instructor for the class. Uh, so the first thing I will be doing is muting everybody. I have a mute all button, and so all of you will be on mute if you're not already. And my mouse is giving me problems again. <laughs> Sorry, guys, mouse problems. Who, who would have thought? You are now muted. Here you are we go. now unmuted. You are now muted. So now I should be the only one talking, and we're going to open it for discussion at the end. Um, Douglas has a quick note saying that if anybody picks up too much noise from Sam's mic, let us know, and we can turn off our air conditioner. Yeah. And Linda, I hear your, uh, I hear the, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, we just have a technical problem on one of the computers here. So um, let me introduce myself, um, I've, I actually, uh, I'm actually a youngling. I graduated uh, recently, uh, not that recently, you know, almost 10 years ago. And uh, it basically, I, got, I, uh, I went to college to become a pharmacist. I did not like it too much, actually. Once I saw that, I worked in Indian Health Service, and I was pretty much like, what is this? Can I program in it? And it was, and uh, since then, you know, uh, uh, I met, I eventually met Rick Marshall, who is now my boss, and he, uh, I, I actually learned, mo learned mums almost, oh, it has been a long time, maybe, maybe starting six or seven years ago. So, um, I would like to share my knowledge of the language with you, and thank you for taking the class, and uh, I'm going to tell you that it's actually an easy language. And, uh, you know, much easier than a lot of the more modern languages that people might want you to learn. And so if you, if you know any other language, MUMS is actually pretty easy compared with the, the other languages. Um, the only problem with MUMS is, you know, at least the way it's done, the way that MUMS is done in Vista is that it's very terse. So let's get started. So MUMS uh, stands for Massachusetts General Hospital Utility Multiprogramming System. Um, you could pretty much ignore everything in the name except the multiprogramming part. MUMS was, uh, MUMS wa when it was developed, it was developed to be a multi-job system. And when most of the com most of the simple computer systems at the time could only allow one user. And uh, it was uh, the person who actually uh, created the MUMS language is Neil Papillardo. Neil um, went, down, went on to found the company called Meditech. And uh, Meditech has be, have been using MUMS ever since. Um, the MUMS language uh, has been standardized in 1977, and essentially it's one of the very first, uh, one of the few first computer languages to be standardized. And uh, the, as a comparison point, the C language was actually standardized in 1989 by comparison. So, um, MUMPS was designed in the 1960s, and its 1960s objective has been, uh, so that you get an idea of wh why does it look the way it looks like today, is that it's, it's designed to replace assembly language. And it's very, very text-oriented. I mean, uh, in, for example, in C, it's like pulling teeth to try to manipulate strings. 
in mumps, that's pretty much all it does is manipulate strings. And you actually, a lot of mumps is just, uh, just working with strings and manipulating them. And by the way, for for people who are not, are not uh, don't have previous programming experience, a string is basically a, a the way that we represent uh, represent a word in a computer or words in a computer, a series of words. So uh, it's just a, it's just like it's a the the opposite of a string is a number. So if it's something that's not numeric, it's it's probably a string. And this is <laughs> this is <laughs> this uh, we actually uh, actually this car is very close to us here, and, <laughs> and uh, I I tend to think of mums as as looking a bit like as looking a bit like this. It's actually it's actually very practical. It takes you pl it takes you places, uh, but you know. It might not be. It might not be the most. Uh, what's, the, what's the way I want to put it? it? Might not be the most gratifying to use. Sometimes. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's a good Sue. Sue, that's right. We could call it elegant. Um, I'm just gonna take a quick pause and make sure make, uh, make sure that our everybody else has joined us. Let me see. I see that Mr. Kranz has joined us, or Dr. Kranz, I don't remember. <laughs> and Mr. Heller has joined her, has joined us. So that's we're good. Okay. I'm no doctor. Huh? Uh, this is Tony. I'm, I'm not a doctor. I'm a nurse. Okay, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know that nurses, uh, in medical informatics, nurses are the chosen ones. That's right. We're used to wiping butts, so after you wipe butts, everything else is it's it's all easy after that. <laughs> okay, good. So, um, the core of mumps, and essentially, when when a lot of people talk about mumps, oh, mumps is a language. It's a language, and sure, I. I don't find that to be very interesting. The language is really cool. It does a lot of stuff, but this is the core. This is the core of the language. The fact that the language has an integrated database inside of it, and the database is called. This is a very weird name. Okay, so if you if you've done programming in any other language and you hear this, your mind your mind thinks, oh yeah, thing. No, it's not. Um, each uh, each top level variable is called a global, and for example, um, the le the the letters P S over here is a global. That's uh, that's essentially a mumps global. So what's a mumps global? It's as if it's a file on disk. It's not really a file on disk though. It's uh, it's stored all. All the mumps globals are stored uh, stored in a in a database format on your uh, on your machine, but uh, it's essentially uh, a global in mumps is equivalent to a file on the machine. If you store something in a global, it's permanent. It means that you can you can shut down your session and come back, and it will stay there. That's exactly like writing to a hard disk, and that's that's exactly what it is. Um, in other languages, when you say global, global usually mean a variable that's available uh, all across the program. Um, no, not quite that. Although that that type of thing exists in MUMS too, but it's we don't call it a global. MUMS global is the actual database storage. So, um, a little bit of history about mumps. Um, mumps was really popular in the 80s and the early 90s. And uh, 
early on in the late 70s and the 80s, it, DSM implementation was recognized as the leader of uh, MUMPS implementations, and it was the one that was used by the VA. Um, Indian Health Service uh, use MSM. Okay, I have a que I have a question here. Uh, Sue asks, what's a DSM implementation? Um, DSM stands for, is basically, it's called, uh, um, I'm trying to remember, date, uh, it's not data tree, it's digital standard MUMPS. Uh, basically, uh, MUMPS was a standard, so everybody who was, uh, every, every vendor was free to create a, uh, free to create an operating system or a virtual machine that complies with the standard and sell it to sell it to users who could write programs on it. And basically, when we say that somebody implemented MUMPS like an implementation, basically they wrote the standard. Yes, so like Cache and GTM. Thank you. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Cache is a MUMPS implementation, so is GTM. Um, uh, DSM uh, basically was used by the VA. IHS used MSM, which was another MUMPS implementation. The DOD, uh, you, like the VA, used uh, DSM. Eventually, VA and IHS, and I don't mention here the DOD, all moved to intersystems cache. And the reason for that actually is pretty obvious. As I, I mentioned it in the next slide. They um, inter intersystems actually bought DSM and MSM. So basically, VA and IHS moved on to the successor for their system. Uh, I do need to mention, by the way, that uh, um, I believe the VA actually ran three different systems. So them using DSM actually is not exactly correct. They used DSM. They use DSM, they also use MSM, and I, they use the third one, and I don't remember what it was. Um, so, um, one thing about MUMS, when, when, whenever we take a look at the code of VISTA, uh, you're, gonna no, you're gonna notice that there's a lot of code that does really weird things, and you're like, why didn't you write it that way? Um, the reason is, actually the reason is simple. MUMPS had several standards, and uh, I believe even before 1984, they did not even have uh, blocks available to the language, which is something we have today. And essentially, uh, essentially I, uh, I'll eventually show you code that runs without blocks, but it's very hard to read. And uh, it's basically you have you have parts of FileMan in Vista that written that are basically written without blo without blocks, and you you see all sorts of strange things happening all over the place. We don't write that way nowadays. Um, George Timson, the person who wrote FileMan, tells me that uh, there are some parts of FileMan that actually go back all the way to the invention of MUMPS from the 1960s specifically the date manipulation routines. And if you ever want to try to read that code, you'll, uh, you'll see what I mean. So um, I'm going to say, you know, uh, what's, what's notable is I believe 84 introduced blocks. Uh, the 90 standard introduced the new command and introduced parameter passing. And the new command is basically a way to scope your variables. And the 95 implemented uh, more finer, finer features like SSVNs and transactions. Um, there was a 98 standard that was not ratified by, the, uh, by ISO and ANSI. So that, uh, that one actually is a lot of the things in 98 still remain to be implemented. So, um, I just, I mentioned this, um, InterSystem bought out most of the competition in the late 90s. They, uh, 
they used to actually support them all for a few years. Then they made Cache as the one as the one to rule them all. And Cache has several emulation modes, and it can emulate MSM and it can emulate DSM. So if there are MSM commands that you need to execute or DSM, Cache can run that. Um, at the time, the only holdout uh, was GTM, uh, but since that time, we actually have two new MUMPS implementation. We have MUMPS v1 and M, uh, M21. And Vista supports, actually, they, Vista does not technically support either one of them, but I, uh, I work, whenever I take a plane ride anywhere, I actually write code to support MV1. So I'm eventually making progress on that arena. And Vista supports uh, GTM and Cache. And uh, sometimes, whenever you read, whenever you read uh, this, whenever you look at some older documentation in Vista, uh, you you'll see that Cache is not called Cache; it's actually called OpenM. Um, so uh, there's something interesting about the 95 standard. Neither one, neither Cache nor GTM fully supports the 95 standard. So and actually, for that matter, ne neither does MV1. Uh, Cache doesn't really do transactions, and GTM does not do SSVNs, or system structured variable names. Um, the thing that's important to know about GTM is that GTM is, is free and open source, which means you could actually look at the source code for it, and you could install it on your machine. But it does not run on Windows, so that's a big thing to keep in mind. And nor does it run on a Mac, so um, it may it makes us a little bit sad it doesn't run on a Mac yet. But uh, it's uh, it's I think one day we'll be getting it on the Mac. Um, so. Um, we and in this class, at least the environments we're setting up are going to be on GTM. Um, but if you have access to a cache system at work and would like to use it, uh, I have no problem with that. You certainly can do so. So, um, big question uh, people ask, oh. Manoj, uh, can you please re repeat the meaning of SSVN? Uh, no, Manoj, actually, I won't repeat the meaning of SSVN because, uh, by and large, it's not used, but not used in Vista. And it's, uh, and if, if you're using, uh, and basically, most of the time, we're not going to, I don't think we're actually going to cover SSVNs in this course. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what they are in a later lecture in advanced feature of MUMPS. But for now, the, don't worry about it. They're not that important. Um, so a big question. So why was MUMPS? Uh, Oh, just an, just another guys. I have Sue. I'm a Mac. How am I to set up GTM? Sue, don't worry. You're not gonna set up GTM on your system. I'm gonna show you. Uh, we're gonna have a shared system where we're gonna program together, and you're gonna have your own account there. So that no, don't worry. Okay. So um, let's talk about why Mumps was chosen by the underground. Um, as the language for implementing uh, implementing uh, an uh, electronic health record. Now let's talk about what's the underground first. So um, in the history of the VA, and I'm going to give you a link, uh, and the history of medical informatics in the VA, essentially the, the way that MUMPS was actually, the, the way that Vista was built in the very beginning was it was, that was a it was essentially an underground effort. So people used their leftover money at the end of the year, or they used they used they bought small items that were that you did not have to get approval on, and they used that to uh, 
uh, by computers and uh, some people created positions that whose visual title was essentially printer support specialist or something like that. And so that person supported printers, yes, but their other, their other secret job was that they actually did programming. And so that was the VA underground, and I'll give you a link later to read more about it. But chose, MUMS was chosen, was chosen as a language for healthcare at the time, that was the late 70s. It, it had big advantages to it. It was a standardized language. That meant there were several vendors that gave you that uh, that gave you the language, and you could actually switch between any vendor that you wanted. Um, it was also perfect for healthcare because it it only dealt it dealt with stuff that healthcare is interested in, and uh, the data model for healthcare uh, basically had a lot of individual data elements all over the place, and so at, as sparse. Uh, the MUMS does something called a sparse, a, sparse, the, a sparse array, and if you use relational databases that were common with COBOL, you could not get a sparse, uh, a sparse array. So what's a sparse array is basically, think of a spreadsheet. Think of a spreadsheet, and if you have several columns in a spreadsheet and you don't have any values for a bunch of columns, you just leave them empty, but guess what? That's that empty sp the, sp the spreadsheet still has to record the fact that you have an F, that you have no data there. MUMS does not even record that empty data. You uh, it can it can it just doesn't exist. So that's what sparse means. It basically means that you can, you don't have to fill in all the rows and columns for every single piece of data. If it's does if, if it's not there, you could just skip it and it will not exist. So um, I'm going to send you this presentation, and uh, you'll be able to click on the links. But uh, the first, the first link is something by Dr. Octo Barnett, who was who was Neil Papalardo's supervisor, and it describe it describes a little bit about the the history behind mumps. There's the Wikipedia page, which always gets a lot of flame wars around it because apparently mumps is not popular. With uh, with programmers who see it in the the first time over, and uh, there's the the history of Vista you'll find on hardhats.org. Okay, um, let me pause here, and before we go on, I want to say I want to uh, I want to ask so far if anybody has any questions. You could unmute your. I actually going to unmute all of you, and if we get bad feedback, I will I will mute you all again. So let me see. You are now unmuted. So if anybody has any feedback and they want to uh, they want to uh, uh, tell me right now questions, and if not, we're going to move on to the next section. I'd like to, I'd like each of us to introduce uh, ourselves and tell us why they are interested. Uh, why are they taking this class? Uh, yeah, hi Sam. This is Manohar. Uh, hi Manohar. Can you please? Uh, yeah, hi. So, can you please repeat the uh, slide or just tell me the full forms of the DSM, MSM, IHS, and VA, please? Um. I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you the slides. How about that? Uh, on the Google group, which we're gonna talk about later, I'm gonna send the slides and attach them, so you could uh, you could uh, see see that slide again. Okay. Sounds yes, good. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I don't have question, but I could introduce myself. Okay. Yes. Let's let's do introductions then. Okay. Uh, my name is Linda Yaw. I'm the director of operations for Vista Expertise Network. Um, I'm the person who takes care of all the money issues. So if you guys have questions about that, um, let me know. Um, I'm taking mumps because it's fun. I've, I've taken to, uh, a little bit of beginning mumps before, and have been able to 
make some small programs that do what I want to do. So that's exciting, and I hope to learn more here. Next. All right, I'm going to start from the top and call people out because I know they won't volunteer. <laughs> and I believe you could blame this on the software, but I believe Anthony Coranz is the first one. <laughs> it looks like I'm the first one. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I go by Tony, uh, but you can call me Anthony if I'm in trouble. Okay, Tony. Tony, and, that's uh, good. That's good. <laughs> Uh, by background, I'm a nurse. I was an ICU nurse and most recently worked at the VA in Denver. Uh -huh. um, I went into informatics in about 2006, uh -huh. and um, I currently support a, um, I, I do patches and enter uh, patient data in a MUMPS database that is uh, used by our developers right now. Okay. So I'm interested in learning build, to build some tools in MUMPS and make things better and easier. Well, fantastic! You're uh, you're a perfect you're one of the perfect students because that's exactly uh, that's exactly what I want. Uh, actually, I think you have a project in mind, and that's what I really want. So <laughs> that's good. All right, um, Douglas, you're next. Oh, my mic doesn't work. Okay, sorry. Hello, I'm a. Uh I'm Douglas Kilbride. I'm the director of Paideia, uh, which basically means I'm kind of like uh, Sam's uh, TA. I help, mm -hmm. help him make sure the class uh, moves along and uh, we smooth through all the rough edges. And uh, I do other stuff around here at Vista Expertise, uh, like uh, keep our websites working and uh, help out with our Vista Expo. And yeah, that's about it. Oh, and also, and just like uh, Linda, uh, I'm mostly learning mumps, or trying to learn mumps, because it's fun. All right, Manohar, you're next. Uh, yeah, hi all. This is Manohar Kaugle from India. Actually, uh, I'm working for uh, Harbinger Sisters Pro System Private Limited as a senior engineer uh, right now. Now we are uh, working on one eye care uh, healthcare product, and uh, here uh, we are using the uh, mumps technology. So uh, just wanted to learn that, uh, so we can utilize that knowledge inside our project. So thank you. Okay, Manoj, you're next. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Manoj Kulkarni. I am from India, and. As I Mano, as Mano said, I am from the same company, and uh, I am as a project manager uh, in that project. Uh, so actually, we are migrating the code uh, from so MUMS to Java. So that's okay. why I, uh, we are interested to learn MUMS. Okay, good. To understand the the beat and pieces, everything. So that's why. Okay, um, so. Let's move on to Rob Felder. No mic, is it there? Okay. Learned M from retiring, and while I've written, I have many holes, hoping to fill them. Well, uh, okay, sounds good. I'll do my best. And uh, I just want to say your reputation precedes you. I've seen many of the programs you've written. So, Sue. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I wasn't sure my mic was on. Um, I'm the events director, um, which means that I'm responsible for the expo. Um, but I'm also working with some lab documentation and maybe working with training in the future. And a basic understanding of what Myers Vista is going to make it easier for me to speak with all the techies you people keep wanting me to speak to. Um, I. <laughs> I unfortunately have no particular project in mind, but understanding mumps will help understand Vista better, and I think in the long run, make me more useful. Okay, that sounds good. Um, let's. So, moving on to Ted. Uh, okay, he doesn't have a type, so he'll type. So he's a nurse, ICURN, MSN, and clinical informatics. Wow, 
you have a lot of stuff. You've done a lot of stuff. So, um, okay. I just want to let you know that we are, we're, we're at least the moms were teaching in in this class and to be sort of, I'm going to say a little bit Vista flavored. So, for example, uh, you know, it's uh, Vista or RPMS flavored. So, you're, it will be all uppercase and whatnot. And so, it's, I mean, if you use other open, other uh, medical systems, they also use mumps, but uh, they don't follow the same convention. But you should be able to follow. They, you should be able to follow the language just the same. Okay, and the last person I have on the list is uh, Thomas Heller. Hi, um, can you hear me? Hi, I could hear you pretty well. Excellent. So, <clears throat> I'm also a pharmacist. Oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I worked for um, the Ann Arbor VA for about 28 years. Worked 12 years in, inf um, in the informatics part, establishing uh -huh. CPRS and stuff at Ann Arbor. Now I wow. work with, with uh, Tony, and he's been prompting me to learn how to do mumps so I can help him do patches and fix other things. So uh, we found out about your class, and so here I am. OK, good. I'm, Tony, which Tony? I'm to remember. All right, so Douglas is back online. So um, okay, sorry about that, guys. We will uh, we'll try not to have this interruption. It's really rare that this happens, but oh well, <laughs> it did happen. Um, we I'm gonna. People. We work for the government. It happens quite regularly, so we're kind of. Okay, used. good. <laughs> oh, oh, I like I like I like your attitude. Uh, we could really be friends. <laughs> so uh, the we, this is the curriculum and. Um, I can click on it, but you won't see my screen. So, uh, but uh, what essentially it has the curriculum, and we're gonna be basically covering covering a lot of the nuts and bolts, uh, nuts and bolts of uh, mumps. So we're gonna, otherwise just going gonna go back now. Uh huh. Where's my mouse? Mouse problems again. Uh, Manaj, you says you're not able to hear me. Oh, we're good. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Uh, he. It looks like everybody else could hear me right now. So, oh, you do, you hear me now? Okay, good. Um. So, um, this is the curriculum, and I'm gonna. I'll see. I think there's a way for us, for me to share my screen, but at least here we go. Share my desktop. I'll do this uh, just a moment. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's good. Okay, I didn't see that. You could you could just put links in the chat. Never mind. I don't need to share my screen then. You could they could see the links for themselves. Okay. Sounds good. And back to this then. Okay. So um, this we're we're gonna do we're gonna do the housekeeping part of the class now, and we need to uh, what I the rest of the class is gonna be focused uh, of today's class is gonna be focused on getting us up and running, and uh, we're gonna be using this service for audio. And so that's, uh, uh, and oh, occasionally when when I have slides to present, I'll be presenting them over here. Um, we have two mumps environments that we're going to use. We're going to use something we're calling vForum uh, for shared screen. So that will share. That's going to share our mumps screen, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna program together in there. Um, then we have the. Uh, then we have uh, a, pro, uh, a place called Paideia where you could sign up for an account and create your own programs. 
Um, now, like I said, we we use GTM over the in both environments. But if you wish to create your own programs on Cache and send me the uh, send me the routines, I don't mind that at all. Um, we also uh, need you guys to uh, accept class the invitations to the Paideia Moms Google Group, and I believe. Most of you have already done that, with a few exceptions. So if you get a Google group invitation for uh, something called Paideia Moms, uh, make sure to accept it so that, uh, and basically what you, need to do, what you need to do if you have a question, and it's pretty easy, is you have to email it to this address. Okay, Douglas says he thinks that everybody accepted the Google Group. So, in order to um, in order to uh, send an email, let me just make sure I have the right address. It's paideia moms at googlegroups.org, right? Let me ch let me check. I'll make sure what well, I'll make sure that I have the right address. Okay, good. Yeah, it is Paideia. It's Paideia Mumps. Copy email address. Okay. Um, if you accepted the group, I just posted an email address. So if you have any questions, you email it to that email address. And the advantage of that is it goes to every one of us. And so uh, the right uh, on that email address it goes to everyone so, so uh, we would know we would know uh, which person to help you and you'll get help faster versus just emailing me and um, uh, that's pretty much it so um oh Susan okay will we be sending out links from V forum Paideia and Google group that's not a bad idea. Actually, for VForum and Paideia, we're we're gonna we're gonna give you uh, we're gonna give you all individual instructions on signing on, because each of you needs to give me a piece of information in order to sign on. But uh, for the Google group, you should already be on it. But we can send uh, we can probably send a little email saying how to send an email on the Google group. Okay. No, okay. D Douglas is saying, you know, maybe, maybe not. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> you already have. Okay, you already have. Never mind. Douglas says he already has. That's good. Never mind. Never mind. Sorry, sorry, guys. Uh, okay. Okay, good. So, what I need from you? Let's let's start with that. What I need from you is uh, you need to accept your Google group invitation. That's the second item. And after the class is over, you could take yourself off the group. So that is that. We've already, we've already gone over that. The other thing is I need something called your public key, your public SSH key, to be exact. Um, now, I, given, given that not a lot uh, not a lot of people have sent me this. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, yes, Manoj, you have, but uh, actually nobody. Uh, I don't think anybody else has uh, given me this one. Uh, let's see. Sue asks, what if we have no public SSH key? You create one, and that's what I'm gonna show you right now. I'm gonna show you how to create a public SSH key. So, so, um, can I? Can you guys type in the chat and tell me what operating system you use? What's your computer running? Is it running a Mac? Is it Linux? Is it Windows? And just type that in the chat. Windows 7 and 8, OK. OK, very good. So I see that uh, I see that most people are on Windows and two people are on a Mac. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the Windows instruction first, and we and then I'm gonna go over how to do it on a Mac. So 
let's start with Windows. So I'm going to try to share my desktop, and I'm going to say share a region. And give me a second while my desktop sharing starts. Okay, I want this region to be much smaller because blue button is not really good for sharing desktops. That's why we're not using it for uh, our main class for sharing desktops because it's pretty slow. Here we go, and I hit start sharing. Okay. Okay, do you see my do you see my uh, my sort of screen? Yeah, I see that people have see it right now. Okay. So what I'm going to what I'm going to bring what I'm going to bring bring up now is I have a little program that I'm going to run that that's the program on Windows. Now, um through some sort of deep magic, I'm running this on my Linux computer. Don't you want that? But uh, it should be the same. It should be the same thing. So, wine. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I could re resize this. Can I? No, I can't. <laughs> Okay, good question. So the first thing, the fin first thing we need to ask is, how are you going to get this program? This is the putty key generator. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say, let me just do a quick Google for it. Putty key and. Okay, I'm gonna paste a URL in the message in the message block. Uh, he says reflections. Can we use it? Uh, let me think. Refle if reflections, um, I don't. You can use reflections to log in. That's the problem. But you still have to have a security key with reflections. If your if reflections can generate an SSH. Uh, public and private key, then that would be fine. You can do that. Uh, but if it doesn't, then you have to use this program. So here's the link, which I just cut, pasted. And you click on that. And in the download page, you're going to find uh, you're going to find uh, Putty for Windows and Putty Gen. You want to you want to download Putty and you want to download Putty Gen. Um, let me see if I could actually move my move my little window a little. I don't know if I could or can't. That's okay. Uh, mm, No, it's it doesn't want to actually move. So I I haven't figured out how to move it yet. So that's okay. Uh, so anyways, you're actually seeing part of the putty page when I bring this up. But essentially, what you're down you're gonna find on that page putty and putty gen and download these. And then all you have to there's this does not require installation. You could just leave it on your desktop. And what you could do then is launch PuttyGen first. And when you launch PuttyGen, this is what you're going to get. This is the program that you get. You see that? So uh, what you want to do is you want to click on this button, Generate. If you click on it, and you just have to move your mouse in this area, and you could see the generation moving on as, we're, as I'm, I'm moving my mouse. Okay, so this is this is what you get in the end. Um, 
Yeah, I encourage you to put a key passphrase on this, but it's optional. You don't have to put a passphrase. So if your computer is secure and you're sure your computer is secure, you don't need to put, put a passphrase. Um, but if it's not, you could, uh, uh, you might want to put a passphrase on this. Make it something short, and basically, a passphrase means that you have to type this before you unlock the key. So, a uh, question: What do I want? What you need to do is, I need this part. You see this, this thing. You could just copy and paste this and send it to me in an email, and it actually goes on. So you need to copy and paste this whole thing. Or what you could do is you could click on this button, save public key, and save and save private key. And if I hit save public key, I would say, I'll just give it as an example. I would just say sam test dot pub and um, I am gonna say, and then I'm gonna say, you have to save your private key. All right, there's no point of doing this unless you save your private key. And to tell you, the, the, you don't have a passphrase. Do you want to protect it? I'd say yes. And I'd say, uh, my private key. That PPK. Okay. So that's this is this is this is what you would do to create a public key on Putty, and you have to say you you need to remember to save your public and private key. At least keep a record keep a record somewhere of your of your public key. I recommend that just in case you actually uh, we actually somehow lose it somehow. But uh, if you save both of these. That's 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 exactly what I want you to do, and you have to send me the public key either either as an attachment or you could just copy and paste this and send it to me, or you could even send it to the Google group. Um, by the way, public keys are public. That's why they're called public keys. So, um, next question is: If you have reflections or you have putty. How are you going to use this in order to log in? So this is the next thing I want to show you. I'm going to close this program. And I'm going to open Putty. OK. So you should be seeing my Putty win now. So um, I'm, we're going to give you we're going to give you the actual address of the system. Uh, that you're supposed to connect into, um, but what that uh, you're gonna the essentially um, let me give you an example. Actually, let me give you an address right now. I think uh, I think I have a message somewhere um, about the address. Let me. I need to stop in sharing for a moment. Uh, let me see this. Okay, I just stop screen sharing for a moment. I have. I just need to go go into my email and look for uh, the. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I found it. This one. Okay. Okay, now I'm ready to share my screen again. So let's go back to, let me minimize this and go back over here. Uh, go back here and click on share my screen, region, run, and it made my region too big again, but let's make it smaller. And Start sharing, and here is Patty. Okay. So 
uh, essentially the way you're going to do putty, um, the way you're going to do it on putty, uh, we are, we are, you're going to type username at vforum.fwslc.com and port number 51051. And username is going to be individual to you. And here's the important part. You need to go under SSH. You need to click on Auth. And you could see where it says private key for authentication. You have to click browse and the private key. So you see this? You see the private key I just created? I'm acting it. I'm going to hit open. OK. So once I'm done with this, will you, what you could do is I'm going too fast. OK, sorry. OK, uh, I'm going to slow down a little for Linda. <laughs> OK, and for everybody else, probably. Uh, you're going to click. OK, so I'm going to go back. We're, uh, we're going to click on SSH. You're going to click on the auth. And then you're going to click on browse at the bottom here for private key for authentication. You're going to find the private key you just loaded, and you're just going to it. And you're going to hit open. And after done with all your settings, so you don't have to do it again, you could type in um, the forum down here and hit save. like this. So every single time you need to connect again, you just click on this and click uh, and click load and then hit open. Now I'm I'm going to I'm actually going to hit open and uh, you're going to see a window that this first, which uh, is going to ask you, you have this key, you have this key, so do you want to connect? I was going to say yes. And um, now it's not supposed to ask for my password because it's supposed to take my key, but I, that's not my key. I was just showing you an example key. If you're supposed to just be able to get in. All right. This pretty much concludes my Windows instructions. Does anybody have any questions? Can you please type them in the chat if you have any questions? And people using AttachMate, I believe AttachMate can do everything Putty can do, and I don't have any problem if you use AttachMate. But uh, I cannot help you with AttachMate because I, um, I, I'm not familiar with it. And I also want to say, Douglas reminded me that Linda has been taking notes, and she's going to be sending the instructions via email as well. OK. so. Moving on to the people who actually use a Mac. So I'm going to see if I could make my window small enough to fit. Yeah, almost. It's good. It's it's good enough. Okay, it's gonna it's gonna. Here we go. Ah, no, it moved in the wrong direction. I. Okay, so, um. If you are on a Mac, this is what you need on the Mac. So what you need to do is you need to you need to open your terminal on your Mac. Now how do I open terminal? I found out that the easiest way to open terminal is to open spot using, uh, using the command base and uh, and then type terminal and select the first hit. So Linda, go ahead, try it. Command space. 
type terminal. And it should be the first first result. All right. Okay. Once you get to terminal, uh, what you need to type in is, I believe it's SSH, GEN. Uh, oh no, actually, uh, I'm wrong. SSH key gen, SSH dash key gen. GEN, yeah, one word. And hit enter. All right, I'm, I'm going to show you what happens when you do that. It's going to ask you, enter the file in which to save the key. If, if you've never done this, if you already have a user key, you just have to hit enter. So I'm... Um, I'm not, I'm actually, I, I can't use the same, I can't use the same uh, key because I already have keys with that name. So I'm just going to call mine Sam test one. All right, but you, you guys could just leave it as is. Then it's going to ask you for the passphrase. This is the same as the passphrase we had with putter one or you could leave it blank. I'm gonna enter one. Oh, okay. It tells me that I uh, my password. I'm gonna try it again. And we're gonna said uh, for you guys, you want location, so don't do what I'm doing. Okay, I'm just showing you the rest. Okay, so this is the important part. So I want you to see this, okay? The two, part, the two lines I'm highlighting on the screen. It says your identification has been saved into this file. Your public has been saved into this file. Now guess what? I want the public key. You have to send me the public key via email. You could send it to the whole group. You could just send it to me. That doesn't matter. So uh, I actually prefer you send it to the group, to be honest, because it's uh, because some.